everyone and welcome to Rad Chat, the multi-award winning first therapeutic radiographer-led oncology podcast. Welcome to podcast number 110. My name's Joe McNamara and I'm joined by fellow host Norman Joel Anderson. Hi everyone. So a big thank you to our last guest, CK, who talked about the challenges of the LGBTQI plus community and what they have to face within healthcare. If you haven't had a chance yet, please do go and take a listen. So we're pleased to introduce our guest, Lynn Buckley, who will be discussing the role of psychosexual counselling for people living with and beyond cancer. So pleased to welcome you to Rad Chat, Lynn. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So, Lynn, for anyone who doesn't know you and has had that pleasure, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself and give us a bit of insight into what it is that you do? So... Obviously, I'm Lynn. I live up in Yorkshire, um, but I do a lot of work online. So I'm a psychosexual therapist, but I also work with trauma and relationships. But my background is I was a gynae oncology nurse specialist and an advanced nurse practitioner for about, I don't know, 20 years. So I started in gynecology back in 1990. Um, retired from the NHS about 18 months ago to concentrate on my psychosexual practice. Um, yeah, so that's my background. So I don't know if you want to know anything more about the background and why I got into this area, but I'm certain you'll yeah, ask me absolutely. if you do. Yeah, absolutely. I'm intrigued as to, firstly, why you maybe decided to go into gynaecology, um, and then obviously the psychosexual side of things as well. Um, it's very niche. It's not something that everyone necessarily thinks when they get into nursing that that's what they're going to do. So I'm intrigued. I think the gynaecology was a probably um i don't uh, uh, because of ne- because of circumstance so i um i worked in neurology initially when i very first qualified and then um i went abroad and worked abroad for a bit when i came home i just wanted a job and i got pregnant i was working in the theaters got pregnant and i was sidelined into gyne because you couldn't work in a theater so that's how i ended up there in 1990 um and then for some reason loved it don't know why but stayed until I ended up my career so I went from being um I worked in on the wards in theatres um in outpatients and so the last 20 years of my career I was a Macmillan nurse in the hospital um and the last probably four or five years of my career I was also an advanced nurse practitioner so I did some extra training after I did my general training sex therapy training and then my advanced practice training um so that's why i went into the gynecology initially cancer again it just i fell into it and had a a lot of personal reasons for wanting to do cancer as well so it was something that i felt really driven towards working with um, people with cancer my specialty with late effects started when um well, I started writing about sexuality and cancer about 2005, so I did because I just thought it was a mi- mixed, mixed topic, um, and then got really involved in late effects of treatment. I had a, a young woman who had cervical cancer, and following her treatment, had really bad pelvic radiation disease, and it involved having a bowel perforation. So I was at a conference and heard somebody, Joel Jarvis Andreev, speak about late effects and um, bowel damage and pelvic radiation damage. So I went to him and said, please, can you come and talk to us in Hull? So he did. And with that, we um, developed a service for late effects, which included bowel, bladder and sex, um, linked with all our specialty consultants. But that was back in probably 2010. So it was very niche, very new, and then I just continued with the late effects, of, but specifically with cancer. Um, with oh, sorry, I'm playing with the dilator here. <laughs> specifically um, with with sexual side of things. So all our consultants used to say, "Oh, have you got a problem? If you've got any problems with sex, go speak about Lynn." They wouldn't even broach the subject. But if the patients did, it was like, "Go speak to Lynn." But by the time I'd finished them, they said, "Well, if you have any issues with sex, we can get you to go and speak to Lynn." Um, so I was one of our consultants used to call me the sex expert. So I thought I'd better try and live up to that. I'm still trying. Okay. But the psychological psychological aspect of it. What further training and stuff did you do? Or was there a lot 
on the job stuff? Um, no, I was very much away from the job. So I worked my hours out so I could have one day off a week. And so on the weekend, I used to go to university um, to do a master's. So it was an, a, an additional master's. I already had a degree, but it was an additional master's. And then I got a placement in a clinic in Doncaster and had a fantastic supervisor. But I had to do 500 hours of practical training um, on the job as a sex therapist, so to speak. I obviously did some practice within my work area, my general gynae stuff. Um, but, but the type of sex therapy that I was doing was general problems. So not necessarily, you know, occasionally somebody with cancer would come through the service, but it would be people with low desire, sexual pain, sexual abuse, um, trauma, so any any difficult erectile dysfunction, so any difficulties with sex, it was very broad spectrum, um, sexual difficulties, sexuality, um, anything to do with your sexual health really. Well, obviously not um, sexual transmitted diseases, but anything to do with your sex life, sexual health. Um, but a lot of it was psychological training. I found that, I would say, 90% of my patients had some sort of trauma or some, and including cancer diagnosis being traumatic that had caused the sexual difficulties. Lynn, can I ask, what was the Masters? Just for anyone who's really interested to kind of further their education in that way. So it was, um, psych, um, my MSc was um, psychotherapy, sex and relationship. But if, so I'm COSRAT registered, so COSRAT is the College of Sex and Relationship Therapists. So if somebody wanted to do some formal training to master's level, then they would want a COSRAT accredited training. COSRAT's got a website, um, COSRAT.org, so C-O-R-S-T dot org. Um, and you can go on there and look at the, the specific training. You can do it to post, postgrad diploma level, um, but it is... To be accredited in Codric, you then got to do another, I think, four or five hundred hours face to face with lots of supervision. To begin with, it's um, one hour in six of supervision, so it's quite heavy going. I wouldn't recommend doing it on top of a full time job. <laughs> did you find that all your nursing background really did help and support you in that, in that educational yeah, field? Yeah, definitely. Um, to be fair, had I not been a nurse, I don't think I would have had the... the ex if I hadn't worked within gynaecology and just went into it, I don't think I'd have had the experience or the knowledge that would have supported me. Um, I know a lot of people that do the training come from a predominantly um, counselling or psychotherapy background and it's a top up onto that. But I think that it really helped me have a real broad biopsychosocial approach to uh, the issues that people were coming to me. So I knew it from the medical side of things. I had a good grasp from there. Obviously, the training with this psych um, psychological stuff, um, and then just developing techniques and skills. As I say, I've been playing with the dilator. So when we think about sex therapy, we obviously take a history. And want to know what the problem is, what's um, predisposing to the problem, what's maintaining the problem, and then we'd have a plan on how can we move forward, what can we do. So we give them really specific suggestions and lots of different homeworks to do using um, a CBT approach, really, so cognitive behavioural therapy. So we try to change the behaviours and the thought processes um, and the emotions so that they all link in together so that people can have a more fulfilling, intimate life. What are some of the general problems that you encounter I suppose, before we get into the oncology side of things? Side. When you think about um, the sexual reproductive cycle, no, I don't even want that. It's not the sexual reproductive cycle, <laughs> the sexual response cycle. So it comes in sort of four or five different um, stages. So back in the 1960s, um, Masters and Johnson did some research in, um, in laboratories where they watched people have sex. So they wanted to see how the body responded. So they look at arousal, um, 
well they notice that obviously we've got arousals so that's erections of um, internal arousal in women, lubrication, um, resolution, which is the, 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 the level between being aroused and orgasming. And then we've got orgasm and then resolution, which is after you finish sex, so your body goes back to how it was. And that's more biological, so it looks at where the blood's flowing and what's happening with your body. A few years later, um, Kaplan, a fem one of I think she was feminist, but they introduced um, the idea that we've also got sexual desire. So we don't just start with arousal, we've got this link for sexual desire. So predominantly we put the sexual problems around these areas, so low desire or no desire, um, arousal difficulties, so that's um, difficulty with getting an erection, not being able to get an erection, not being able to get aroused, so all problems around arousal. Um, there's not usually many problems within the middle bit because if you're already aroused you can maintain that. Then looking at orgasm difficulty, so anorgasmia, although um, you know, sex doesn't have to end in orgasm. It could be, I think with guys, we just link orgasm to ejaculation, but that's two different processes. Um, so anorgasmia or multiple orgasms. I've seen people who've come with, um, there's a disorder where you just have one orgasm after another after another. Um, that could be really quite distressing. And then resolution problems. So resolution is where you, you may not um, recover, your body may not recover, you may have pain, but you can also have pain on penetration. Um, so that's the sexual issues. But then we also look at um, relationships and gender and the diversity that goes along with that, because you may have somebody that's asexual, so they come with this low desire, and when you actually explore it further, they've got never had any desire, but they're not interested in sex, and they're asexual. Um, they may be struggling with their gender identity or they may be also um, have different relationship diversities because you know, nowadays we don't just think about a heterosexual couple. We've got you know broad spectrum of um, polyamory, open consensual non-monogamy, monogamous relationships. So there's a whole broad spectrum which some people may struggle um, to find what fits for them. But then also, as I say, there's also the trauma. So sexual difficulties re related to sexual abuse, um, sexual assaults, childhood trauma. So it's a whole kit so and then, caboodle. What, do, what typically would you see for oncology patients? <laughs> Depends on what the treatments have been. So, um, with women, often because obviously they're going with a lot of treatments, they go through menopause. So there's a lot of the menopausal problems. So we have vaginal dryness, vaginal atrophy, and um, if they've had pelvic or um, internal radiotherapy, then you also see lots of anatomical changes, which will make it more difficult to have penetration and um, lots of pain. Um, low desire and that could be related to the treatments people are on because emotionally they've got nothing left in the bag to want to be intimate it may be that they're on antidepressants which can also affect your desire with men um, again depending on what treatments they've had so we can have diff sexual pain difficulties in getting erections um, anorgasmia or retrograde uh, ejaculation um, anal pain if they're wanting to have anal sex and they've had treatments around their anus um, if someone's had a, the clitoris removed then obviously orgasm is very difficult but we can look at sexual satisfaction not just at orgasm um, body image can be affected also some cancers people might think that their, their partners might not be interested in sex because they're frightened of catching cancer or they're frightened of causing pain. Um, huge, broad spectrum. When you have someone, obviously, who's been through cancer treatments and you understand their medical history, how do you engage with them? Because there must be lots of different aspects of trauma or problems to unpick. 
I know there are proformers and stuff you can use, but just interested to know what sort of techniques or how you talk to people about it. I think you've got to be careful because if you're if you're working looking after someone's cancer treatment after the cancer treatment and want to address their um, sexual difficulties or ask them if there is any sexual difficulties you then don't nece necessarily want to open that can of worms to go in as deep as what somebody would be if there was a psychosexual therapist or a psychologist um, if somebody was coming to see me then they've obviously not had much success um, before they, they get to me because I would say that with oncology 90% of the, if someone's got sexual difficulties 90% can be dealt with before they have to come and see somebody you know my with my expertise in assessment and management of the psychological and the sexual elements you guys and probably most of the people that are watching it who are professionals can probably prevent them from coming to see me well I shouldn't say that should I because you know it's my job um if we think that there's a model called the plicit model so it's p-l-i-s-s-i-t -S -S -I and it stands for p is permission li is limited information ss is specific suggestion and then it is intensive therapy so intensive therapy is when they get to, to the likes of me anybody who is looking after a patient should be able to give permission even um i don't know the portrait at the door you know if if someone's looking no maybe not the portrait at the door when somebody's walking through but but you know be a conversation starter should, yeah it? yeah well, let me, but you never know you you know you don't know who the patient is going to open up to yeah but so it's about if somebody says something if a patient says something to any health professional, they can say, oh, do you know what, I don't really know much about that, but I'll find somebody who does. So giving permission that this is an open topic of conversation. Limited information then comes probably where you guys start to do the radiotherapy treatment. So when you're having radiotherapy, you may find that you're going to have some soreness in your anus. Your vagina is going to feel dry. You know, you're going to feel sore because you've had some, I don't know, radiotherapy on your face. It might impact on who, when you're kissing and being close to your partner. So it doesn't, we're not just talking about sex. Sex is, penetration is the sort of like last bit of it or not always involved in it. Because you've got to think about all the intimacy and all the other bits that happen as well. So I think anybody who was looking after any patient can open this as a conversation. Even something as simple, oh, I love the way your hair looks. If somebody's, you know, got, and you are seeing people every day, aren't you, when they're coming in for the radiotherapy. So notice that they've got the hair, oh, oh that's a nice new lipstick, or, because um, that looks at someone's sexuality and still sees them as, you know, a, a person who, I don't know, is portraying um, who they are. If that makes sense, I don't know whether that. Because sometimes I do. I've got a menopausal brain, so I go off on a tangent sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I thought that was really good. Um, Lynn, I am a big fan of prehabilitation, and I definitely know when it comes to sex and intimacy, it's very limited about the information and support that we give patients. How, if patients are listening to this podcast episode, how can they almost prepare themselves for? changes to their body changes psychologically as they go through cancer treatment most cancer sites have really good charities attached to them prostate cancer uk breast cancer uk um joe's trust eva peel and um, the ovarian cancer charity so ovarian um, overcome and um, target ovarian Brain cancer societies, you know, obviously I'm, I'm predominantly gynae, so I know all the gynae ones, but nearly every cancer charity will have literature and information that people can go and look. Macmillan, it's, um, yeah, Macmillan website as well. So nearly every cancer site or will have a, a charity or information on the internet that we can go and start to read. 
encouraging patients to ask. And if somebody sort of shuts that conversation down, just you wonder why the people are shutting the conversation down, but it's probably their embarrassment or that they don't know. So if, this, if somebody shuts the conversation down to say, oh, maybe you don't understand, but is there somebody else I can speak to? Um, so knowing what the kinds of treatments are going to be. And I can remember looking after a lady a long time ago who had um, vulval cancer, and as part of that treatment, she had the clitoris removed, and nobody told her. So, so thinking about when you're consenting or when you or when you're being consented to ask the questions, will this impact on my intimate life? You don't have to say sex life. And don't rule out somebody who's in their 80s because they might still want to be intimate. I had one patient who came to me once. Um, she was sent through, go, see, go speak to Lynn. And she, wanted, she was 84 and she wanted to know if she could still have sex. So I said to her, you can absolutely have sex as much as I want. I said, as much as you want, but I would just be concerned potentially about your husband's heart. She went, don't worry, love, he's 20 years younger than me. He can last. And so as she was leaving, I said to her, I hope everything goes okay. Um, give me a shout when you next come. She went, do you want me to ring you when I next come? I went, yeah. And she went, really? I went, oh, no, no, it's okay. And a, a boyfriend, a boyfriend was with her and he sort of looked, we just burst out laughing. So, so don't rule out your 84-year-olds. Um, but you don't have to say to them, you know, when did you last have sex? Is it painful having sex? You can just say, how's things? Anything, you know, is, is your intimate life okay? And intimacy can be, as I say, a kiss, a cuddle. Is there anything you need? Is there anything I can help you with? From prehabilitation, um, you know, especially with prostate cancer, you know, if you can get that penile health good to begin with, you know, speak to your nurse specialist or to your consultant. So maybe using pumps so that you can get some really good... Um, blood flow coming through the penis so you can really help with that because often with prostate cancer depending on what treatments you have if it's poor at the beginning you're not going to get any better at the end so if you can really improve that health of the tissues but again with any tissues then you know increases the chance of recovery afterwards lynn i've got a personal question for you which you don't have to answer if you don't want to. So as healthcare professionals, obviously through CBD, we learn and we explore different ways to communicate with people and what we do. Do you find that now being a sexual, psychosexual, a sexual therapist, sorry, um, that things have changed in your intimate life? Yeah, I think I'm more aware of what happens. I mean, we never always practice what we preach, do we? Let's be honest. Um, but, you know, I, if there's something not quite right, I know how to, what to do and how to help it. Um, I, I know that my friends' sexual lives have all improved quite a lot. You know, lots of them come to see me for the, the lubes and, um, you know, so and nearly everybody I meet, it's quite funny because my husband always says to people, well, he doesn't actually, but he usually comes out in conversation that I'm a sex therapist and I can guarantee by the end of play, everybody knows, you know, secretly they come and ask me questions. Um, I don't know, I love my little clitoris so this is like a, a life size model of the clitoris and so we bring it out at Christmas parties and, and people are always like let's play guess what it is and lots of people don't know what it is which is fine I'm even wishbone <laughs> yeah it's fine, somebody thought it was a card holder to hold something on but yeah so you know it becomes an open conversation it's amazing how many people are like Ooh. or if, if I'm in I can remember being in the pub once and I was speaking to somebody and they were asking me a question. Suddenly somebody's ears picked up and they came up and said, oh, can I just ask you? So, so yeah, it's um, sometimes people are more interested, were more interested in me being a sex therapist than they were in me being a, a nurse. So it was really quite funny when, when they knew the two. And I said, but no, my main job is I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nurse. You know, that's really interesting. But no, they didn't want to know about sex. Do you think that's from a societal kind of, or oh, it's something that we don't openly talk about and yet people actually do want to talk about it or they want advice and they want support? If you think that when we're in our normal language, think of all the curse words, all the swear words, nearly every single one is to your genitalia or to a sexual act. 
so it's dirty, isn't it? We don't talk about sex. Oh, you know, and especially with cancer patients, it's like, how can you, you know, you should just be grateful that you're, that we've given you your treatment and you're doing well. Or, you know, I have, have a patient that say, oh, I don't want to talk about that because you've done so well, I don't want you to think I've done, you know, you've done anything wrong. And so I, I think we're brought up that sex isn't an open topic. Um, it's, it's something that we shouldn't watch. I mean, especially, I mean, I'm in my 50s and, I can remember seeing the first lesbian kiss on TV on Brookside and it was like, oh, shock horror, it was all over the news. Whereas, you know, things have moved on and there are more like sex education, the um, TV programme on Netflix. I mean, that's done loads of people's sex lives, I'm certain. Um, but I think also lots of people learn about sex from pornography and that's, you know... We don't always start with a really hard penis and a really wet vagina, you know, and everything being amazing and wonderful. But if if that's what you're gauging your sex life on, then you'll you know you'll be sorely disappointed. I would suggest. Uh, How do you find sex education with children? I think we've talked about this quite a few times on the podcast, but I remember my sex education classes when they started talking about periods. All the boys had to leave the room. And all of that kind of stuff. I don't obviously. I don't know how different it is now, but yeah. I don't know how different it is now, um, but I think we should be talking about relationships and and bringing sex into that because sex is just one part of a relation, even if it's a one night stand, you know. But it's um, and bringing in again. This is my sex therapy said about consent, um, about learning what you like for you. You know, not just going along with what the other person wants to do, you know, so exploring um, bodies. And I think sex education is mainly a function, isn't it? So it's about not getting pregnant, not getting an STD, and wait until you're 25 and married before you want to have sex. So I don't think, it, I don't know how much it's changed because I'm, I'm, you know, my kids were pretty well informed. They're in their 20s now. And most of their friends were pretty well informed and... Most of my friends would say, go and speak to Lynn. Um, so I think it should start earlier. Because then if, if you know that it's okay, that what's right and what's wrong, then you know, it will save a lot of difficulties later in life. Can I ask, before you went into gynaecology and obviously specialised specifically in psychosexual counselling, um, how do you much knowledge from your education about sex and intimacy? Not really, no. Um, I mean, I didn't know what the clitoris was. And, well, I didn't know what the clitoris was. I didn't know that it looked like this until um, I started doing my sex therapy training, So, which was... 15 years ago you know I thought like everybody else it's just the tip you know I didn't know that there was this whole thing underneath um the, the vulva and so no I, I would be like anybody else I I fumbled along like most people so, oh, and do you think sorry. sorry I couldn't get my mic off then <laughs> <Here you go. laughs> I was going to ask do you think that it should be part of all pre-registration um, education for healthcare professionals, maybe with not necessarily for in every area, but you no, know, I can't imagine if you're treating adults that there aren't many areas that potentially someone's sex and intimacy might be affected. Absolutely, I do. Um, so when I trained, we use the twelve activities activities of daily living, and one of them was sexuality. And we used to say, are you married? Tick. And that was your, your sexuality. I don't think it's necessarily appropriate to go into in depth, you know, oh, you're married and you're having sex and does it hurt? And how many times do you have sex? And I don't think that's appropriate, appropriate unless it's relevant to, well, how many times do you have sex? It's never going to be relevant to what, what we're asking and what we're doing. Um, but I, I can remember writing a blog for the Nursing Times a few years ago and I think it's it was easier for people to talk about people dying than it was about their intimate life. 
Um, and I know still people just tick. You know, it's on that list, let's just give it a tick. And it's about safety as well, because, it, you know, um, if you're in a room and you say to somebody, oh, when you've had your treatment, you'll be okay, you can have sex. What happens if they don't want to have sex? What happens if their partner, either male or female partner, is abusive? So, you know, it's, it's okay to say, I would, I think it's really appropriate that you've got the knowledge and the understanding of sex and intimacy in your training. But then I think it's appropriate to be, to make it an open conversation, but give people the opportunity to come and talk to you about it when they want to be. If you open that conversation, so, you know, if you do have any issues with sex or intimacy or your intimate life, please feel free to come back and talk to me because that gives them an opportunity um, to be able to be open about that. Some of the bits you mentioned around obviously partners and I suppose setting expectations, that's something I've definitely seen with younger patients who maybe have been put into menopause due to their treatment and then they're in their 20s or 30s and trying to be intimate again with their partners. It's the, the body confidence issues um, and things like that and then trying to make sure exactly as you said there's consent, they feel safe but also that the partner feels safe to instigate that. I suppose that's a big area as well isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And also that, you know, if they have got side effects, so if they're going through the menopause, potentially they're going to have a really dry vagina. It's going to hurt. So, you know, if one of the things you could say, and this is how you can open it up, because you can be really factual and just say, if you're being intimate, is it uncomfortable? Do you use lubrication? And choosing the right lubrication, so having some knowledge. So I've got a couple of samples. So I usually recommend, um, yes, so, but you can't use an oil base if somebody's using condoms. So being aware that you can't use oil-based lube with condoms, you can use silicon-based or water-based. Um, and if somebody's, um, if they can't have localised oestrogen, using a vaginal moisturiser regularly, just like we use face cream. But when you're using the lubricants, using a mixture. So if you put the oil based on the skin and the water based on whatever's going in the vagina, it's got this slide and glide effect, which is really helpful. Or there's um, some of this, this, this company, um, Desert Harvest. They also have a lubricant that's got um, some lidocaine in it. So a local anaesthetic, which can also be helpful, but telling somebody how to use that. So you know, you put it on beforehand, you don't necessarily want your partner to have a numb penis or um, a numb tongue. And so being aware that, you know, letting it, it soak in before you use, so if you're going to use a condom with this because it's oil-based, um, oil it's water-based, that it will protect from the penis if it's going inside becoming numb. So you knowing and you can find these things, you can just write to some of the companies and they'll send you some samples for free. Um, sent me a sample, I've just shown you. I didn't pay for any of them, I got them from, from the company. <laughs> yeah, that's that. But also then, you know, if somebody like with um, who've had, say, radiotherapy for cervical cancer, if their vagina's shortened, then we know if in the past your penis has gone in that deep but your cervix um, your radiotherapy has narrowed your vagina then penetration just this deep is going to be painful um, well if it's that deep it's going to be painful but if you're going to stop here it's going to be easier but that's quite difficult when you're actually in the throes of things so there's these amazing little things called donuts that you can put over just let me do this I should have prepared one earlier shouldn't I so, <laughs> you can put over your sex toy or or the penis and so there's no way you can go in as deep so there's lots of things that are out there that you can you know somebody that you're looking after or if you're a patient just have a google around to see what there is that can help why don't we give some of these things sorry joe uh, why don't we give some of these things with dilators for patients already because the cost you know, the dilators are expensive in their own right. I mean, these are the dilators that are issued from in the NHS on prescription. But they're quite hard and tough. Uh, but they work. They're great. I'm not knocking them. 
but then you can think about something that's like a silicone and that's a really big one that's just small a, a silicone one which is softer and more gentle i mean i think we do issue lubrication i think with the emil um you can get silk which is also quite a good lube and um, so i think these come with a sash of silk but i think we tend to just prescribe ky if we're we're doing which isn't very good you want something that's ph balance which these other ones are um but we don't talk about lube we just say there's some lube how you get on with it basically don't we it's, we just expect people to know what they're doing but they may do but they may not yeah we only usually give one sachet don't we which yeah. if we're then asking them to use every day and i certainly know from a like talking to patients from a different culture some of the things that they would ordinarily use on their skins like coconut oil they think that that's then okay to use um and obviously that that ne isn't necessarily the case um and can then ir really irritate and cause then further problems down the line yeah i'm glad you mentioned people from another culture when i did my thesis um when i did my master's my it was on how women experience the sexuality following um treatment for gynae cancers and it was i looked at all different papers um international papers and I, I think you know we just like i said about don't ignore older people don't ignore people from different religions as well and different cultures again it's not about how's your sex life do you want any help it's just you know if you have any problems with closeness or intimacy please feel free to come and ask and i the research that I did came with that the majority of people want you to open that conversation professionally and factually. So, and I think your um, consent forms have now changed, haven't they? So they do put on there what the sexual side effects may be, or the, the changes in their um, anatomy and physiology. So that's how you could change that. So the radiotherapy for vaginal cancer is going to cause difficulties with penetration or putting anything into your vagina because the tissues get shortened. So you're factual. You're not making it personal and um, intrusive into someone's love life. Or, again, recognising that if somebody's practising anal sex, that it may be difficult because we're going to have radiotherapy on your anus. It's going to be sore. How can you work around it? So also letting people know what they, when to use condoms if you've got um, radioactive beads in. So just being aware of what your treatments can do to the body and to the partners. And don't forget solo sex. So if someone's single and they say, oh, I don't, I don't, well, you know, they, they may have a, use a sex toy, they may want to touch the body, but making that okay as well. And multiple partners. Be aware that if somebody is in a polyamorous relationship that there may be one more than one partner involved. Lynn, I know that something that we often get asked um, through Rad Chat from younger patients is around how to manage kind of sex and intimacy when you haven't got a partner but you now have, you know, the consequences of going through cancer treatment and you're navigating that whilst also dating and kind of having those first conversations about the fact that actually my body is different um is there any advice that you would give to patients who are maybe just starting today or having one night stands or you know is there any advice that you or or people that are supporting patients should be offering them i suppose the thing is about being prepared so if they know they're going to need to use lubrication then make sure they're prepared for it and it's not necessarily about stopping and saying oh just stop i need to get my lube out bringing that into oh i always use lube and you know bringing it into the foreplay i would suggest that if you're going to be sexually intimate with somebody that you should have the confidence to say sometimes my body doesn't work as well as it should and we might need to do something different so um and being able to say if it is uncomfortable or painful let's do something else you know if it's a young guy and you can't get an erection then let's think about other things that he, that they can do so oral sex and um, exploring each other's bodies so um 
I think it's about feeling safe and trusting somebody to be able to open that conversation. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say if you're putting on a dating app, it's the thing that you put on a dating app, you know, straight away. Um, so it's about when you get speaking to, to that person. Um, oh, brain just went. I was going to say something really good then, I hoped. Maybe not. <laughs> so it's... Um, Having a, well, I always think about safety anyway. So, you know, making sure that they feel comfortable and spending time exploring their own body so they know what works and what doesn't. Um, so that they can then adapt to that when they're with, with somebody new or um, what if they're in a relationship already with their partners. Um, yeah, I think really liked yeah. your point actually Lynn about having the confidence you know if you're going to have a sexual intimate relationship with someone I suppose the difference between if someone totally healthy and had a sexual function compared to someone who maybe was living with late effects um, or required extra additional help is that fact that you know they need to be able to have that conversation um, and if they haven't got that confidence, is it the right time to maybe invest in yeah. in a intimate relationship with someone? Yeah. And as you just said about late effects, um, you know, it could be that one of the late effects is bowel, bowel or bladder problems. So making sure that, you know, hopefully that they can empty the bladder before they go, they're being intimate. Um you know, or whatever it is that they can do to help themselves. I don't know if, if they've got those stools that they can take some emojium if they're, if they're going to be intimate or if they're usually, you know, um, if they're having anal sex, if they usually have to clear out the bowel or something like that. So whatever it is that they need to do. So it's, I suppose it takes away the spontaneity in a way, but I wonder if that's maybe better to take a bit of the spontaneity away so that when you're there you can feel relaxed and be spontaneous and the other thing that I was going to say that was going to be really clever just before is there's a survey called the NatSal survey and that looks at people's sexual behaviours um, it interviews people from 16 to 64 I think they do it every 5 or 10 years and it shows that about 80% of people have sexual difficulties anyway a lot of my clients who I see who are young never had cancer treatments but they still have difficulties with sexual pain and um, irregular er um, erections premature ejaculation so you know somebody without cancer can be out there with sexual difficulties as well the cancer doesn't necessarily it might make you know give you new difficulties that you didn't have before but there's loads of people that are out there with sexual difficulties anyway one or more Can I ask, Lynn, just linked onto this, how do you help people gain their confidence back in their bodies? I do a lot of different exercises. So one of my favourite exercises to give people is to do sensual showers. So basically, it's when you have a shower, it's been, and I recommend it to anybody anyway, it's really good, it's been really mindful. So feeling the water running across your hair, or if you've got hair, Oh, down your face and um, noticing how warm it feels when you're washing your hair what does that shampoo smell like what does your body wash smell like what would you imagine i don't need to lick it to taste it what would you imagine it tastes like what noises can you hear maybe playing some music or the trickle of the water what does your skin feel like when you're rubbing it and if you've got a sponge what does it feel like with the sponge so really connecting with all your five senses and what does it feel like when you're noticing all of this happening and it doesn't have to be that if you you know you're trying to turn yourself on it's not about trying to turn yourself on it's about trying to connect to your body because patients have given us their bodies to treat this is about them claiming their bodies back and um, so being totally when they get out of the shower moisturizing what oh towel dry first obviously you don't want to moisturize before you dry so what does it feel like with the towel on your skin if you rub a bit hard what does that feel like and notice your body reaction so if it is that you've gone over a nipple and your nipple's becoming erect just be aware of that and that sensation 
and then moisturise. So really taking care and um, of the whole five senses. But then also wear your best perfumes if you wear perfume. There's no such thing as saving something for best. Get dressed up, wash your hair, blow dry your hair if you, you know, or if you've lost your hair through cancer treatments, put your wig on if you want, or your hat, or or be bold and proud, whichever it is that. But it's you know wear your nicest clothes, your best underwear, and um, so really treating yourself regularly like you would do if you're going out on a really nice night out. Great advice, Lynn. Um. I want to know how many of you are there like you're you're one of only a handful of people I know who do this and I'm sure any patients listening will be like I need a Lynn in my life um <laughs> how can they access a Lynn and um, are you rare <laughs> um I would say having the dual expertise of being a cancer nurse and a sex therapist relatively rare I mean I know a handful a couple of handfuls um and some really good ones out there um the cosra website has a directory of um of qualified therapists so you know you, for the directory um you can go on there and be a, a therapist that's done the training you can be an accredited therapist which is somebody who's done the training and then done lots and lots of things you know lots more hours extra um and then you can be a senior ther- um, senior accredited therapist, which you'll have been qualified for five years. But again, you've got to do more paperwork. I'm, I'm a bit too lazy. I don't want to write another essay. Just, <laughs> um, but, you know, so go on there. There's a, there is a registry of therapists and that is probably the only registry of qualified psychosexual therapists. Um, but again, then it's, filtering through to see if there's somebody who's if you want somebody with the cancer expertise um so it should be in people's bios thank you then so we always end our podcast episodes we've got about 110 other questions we would love to ask you but we need to make sure that you uh, get some time to yourself this evening um so have you any top tips for anyone listening to the podcast episode, healthcare professionals, patients, uh, students who are training, anyone at all out there that you'd love to get across? Make it an open topic of conversation. When do you start? When do you bring it into the conversation? When you start talking about treatments. So for patients, don't be frightened of bringing it up. And if you don't know, pass on. So you might be the first person to have the confidence to say something to. So don't shut them down. Be honest. Say, look, I don't know. Or this is out of my comfort zone, but I know somebody who does. And so go out there and find somebody who, who does that you can pass on. Because there will be a nurse, a radiographer, um, or somebody out there that will maybe have different knowledge. But remember that it's a pyramid of care. 10% should only be coming to see me. You know, there's 90% under there that should be dealt with um, in-house or beforehand. And remember that communication is the biggest, biggest help. Perfect. Oh, thank you so much, Lynn. It's been lovely having you on and I've learned lots. Um, and I always like talking about sex and intimacy because I do think it's definitely a topic that maybe people shy away from or, or lack the confidence. So hopefully yeah. this podcast has helped people think about how they can start to engage in those conversations. So thank you all for listening to Rad Chat. Your hosts today have been myself, Jay McMara, and Nam Jelka Anderson. If you're utilising this podcast for CPD purposes, consider the reflective questions posted along with the links to the resources and literature that we've discussed. To receive your accredited CPD certificate, please complete the Google form linked with the podcast. Our next guest feature will be John Organ, who will be discussing his life after a laryngectomy. So thank you all for listening and take care.